I'm proud to be a West Pointer. I'm proud to be a Ranger. I'm proud of my country and I consider myself a patriot. Hi, everyone. I'm Alan Salisbury, and welcome to Profiles in Service, a podcast that explores service in all its dimensions, service to our communities, service to the nation, and even service to humanity. This is a big day for us because this is episode one, numero uno, our inaugural podcast. I think you're in for a treat because I'm thrilled to have as our very first guest on the program, Tom Deerline, military hero, a hero in the business world, and as you will soon see, a selfless human being who continues to serve us all through his humanitarian efforts. Welcome to the program, Tom, and thanks for being willing to be part of episode one. No, I'm, I'm honored to, to be here. You know, it's, it's interesting. You know, I, I always cringe when I hear the, uh, the, the hero moniker, right? Like, <laughs> The, you know, because we it, it has gotten overused over the last little bit, but it's like, I, I got agree. shot, so all of a sudden I'm a hero. Like, I, you and I are both ex-military, so it's like, when we, we know what real heroes look like, right? And those are the folks that do heroic things. They go above and beyond when the stakes are the highest. I happen to get shot just standing there not doing much. So I wouldn't describe myself as a hero, but I would describe myself as somebody committed to service. You are today founder and CEO of Thundercat Technology, a very successful $400 million company providing technology services primarily to the federal government. And you also run the TD Foundation as a significant source of support to service members, veterans, and military families. I want to talk about those later, but first I'd like to start with a backstory of how you got to where you are today. Your career was launched with your graduation from West Point, the Military Academy in 1989. But I understand you set your sights on that years earlier as a young teenager and son of a World War II veteran. Can you tell us how that all began? Yeah, so I, I, I'm one of nine. I'm eight out of nine. And I grew up in, in White Plains, New York and, and had a, you know, a fairly traditional upbringing, right? And, and you don't realize it at the time until you get out into the world and you meet other people that have had different, di different diverse backgrounds and different experiences. Uh, so my dad was a China Marine at the end of World War II. So he was with General Joe Stilwell and that, and that whole bit. But it was like, I think, 46 to 48, early 49. So he wasn't, it was post-World War II, but I think he's technically considered a World War II veteran. Uh, and my sister was a naval nurse, but, you know, she did ROTC, uh, you know, to help pay for, for um, school. You know, my dad could certainly stretch a penny. Uh, you know, I, I, so, you know, she went in the military, but more through a medical ROTC route. And actually that same sister took me up to a football game and we, we were visiting West Point. And I was like, I was actually very attracted to the honor code at the time. I, you know, I could see that it was a prestigious school. And uh, I thought that the bonus was that you got to go in the military. I didn't think that that was the payback. I was like, and they let you go in the army for five years. So even though I grew up in the seventies during Vietnam, like it's not like today, right? Like I didn't sit and watch the evening news with my parents, right? Like that's not, I didn't, I wasn't aware of it. I was still in the backyard with, my brother and Andy Olson or Michael Kennedy playing Cowboys and Indians or, you know, Army. I didn't realize what was going on during that time frame. And so my frame of reference was the Reagan Bush era and, and the, you know, the, the, the pride in America and Americans military and, you know, the ongoing uh, fight with the Cold War. So yeah, when I was 13, I just said, oh, I'm gonna go to West Point. And it really, it really changed my teenage years because um, you know, I went from being an AB student to straight A pluses. I went from being on the track team to captain of the track team. I went from being in the ski club to president of the ski club. I went from being involved in my community to serving in my community. So 
even if I hadn't gotten in, it, it, it made me a better person. It gave me the foundations and fundamentals. It's interesting trying to become a whole candidate and, and, and become a better person that, that West Point would want to attend. I became a better person regardless if I had gone or not. That, that really is a, a great backstory. Um, as a cadet, you were pretty much of a, of a straight shooter, but uh, you did have one kind of major run-in with the disciplinary system, which I think you'll know what I'm talking about. Can you tell us how that went down? Yeah, so um, at West Point, you know, it's a military school. And when you go there, there's, a, there's people maybe have heard the, the fourth class system. So as a plebe or a freshman, you sort of have limited rights and you're, you're more controlled and you're spending that year learning about the military, but also learning how to be a good follower. Um, and then you graduate into immediately sophomore year, you start leading others, junior year leading more. And as a, as a senior, you start leading entire groups of individuals. And my first time away from the academy for any period of time was over Christmas break. So when the first semester was over, I made it through basic, I made it through Peace Barracks, I made it through first semester, okay. And then I went on a ski trip with an, a buddy of mine from uh, high school, went on a ski trip up in Vermont and we got a little crazy and a little drunk and a little stupid. So I ended up spending the night in jail. <laughs> now you would think, oh, you know, West Point, they love the crazy and wild ones. It turns out they do not, they do not love the crazy <laughs> wild ones. So I finally went to, you know, the hearing and, and they you know, said, yeah, you know, you, you're, Guilty, right? UCMJ, you know, conduct, uh, conduct on becoming an officer and a gentleman. I, you know, I forget. It was like 10.11, 10.12. I do remember that. I'll have to go look that up after this podcast. And also, you know, bringing discredit upon the core. And it made sense. Like, I, I did, was an idiot. I did get arrested. I did spend the night in jail. The charges got dropped, but that didn't change the facts that I had done things that were embarrassing. And, uh, so now it comes down to the day. I get called up. Now it's late April, maybe mid-April of my freshman year, and I get called to see the superintendent. And for your listeners here in the podcast, the superintendent is the three-star general that oversees the United States Military Academy. And uh, the other thing that's important for this part of the story, if it's separated, it means kicked out. So when someone is separated, it means you're separated from the core cadets, it means kicked out. So when they use the word separated, it's very important for this story that you know that that means you're out. So I go into his, you know, I put on my dress grays, everything is polished to perfection. You know, I am sweating bullets. I walk in and it's, it's like right out of a movie, right? Like all this oak wooden office that seems like it's, it's as big as a football stadium. He's sitting behind this giant desk and, and on the, the walls, right, are Grant, Lee, Eisenhower, Bradley, um, Pershing. And it's almost like they're all staring at me and just disapproval. Anyway, so I'm sitting there and talking to the superintendent. He's going through my case. And then suddenly the, the room started to pendulum. Or I felt like my chair was penduluming from underneath me. And then everything that the, the general was saying to me was echoing. And like, I'm, I'm trying to be major focused because I got to answer yes, sir, no, sir, no excuse, sir. And then I realized the echo is inside my own stomach. Like it, there is like a full, like I am melting down. Anyway, so he was very understanding and he was very knowledgeable. He goes, I bet when this happened, you were thinking this and it was true. And he goes, I bet when you told your dad what happened, this is the first thing he said. It was as if my dad told him, like he, he just, he was very perceptive of what I had gone through physically, emotionally, psychologically. He was very aware of that, you know, of the situation. And, um, and then he got to the end of it and we talked back and forth and it was like a half hour meeting. And he says, well, let's, let's get on with it then. And he pulls out a piece of paper and he says, well, it is now, you know, it has now been determined that Cadet Private Thomas J. Deerline, blank, 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 so Company C1, Class of 89, has uh, been found guilty of UCMJ 1011, 101.2, a USCC, United States Corps of Cadets, 
you know, 493, bringing discredit and embarrassment upon the core cadets. And, and therefore, it has been determined that he should be separated. And then he put the piece of paper back on his desk. And I was like, oh, like a gut punch. And then he picks it back up and he goes, lucky for you, there's a comma here. Comma, but that this separation be suspended for a period of six months, 35, 120, and three. Like, like <laughs> my, you know, he has my light in his hand and he sort of cracks a joke at the end. So this was kind of a transformative event, uh, just like uh, you in your teenage years had become an, uh, instead of an AB student, an A student, et cetera. This kind of, I said, I guess, uh, reset your attitude going forward, wouldn't you say? Yeah, and, and I think that it was an important lesson, right? Because at the time I was still only 18 years old. Like in, I, in the summer of 85, I was 17. So I had just turned 18, I was very young. Um, and I think it is the importance of you know, taking a step back and looking at, at, at someone's character and, you know, appreciating who they are. And he gave me a second chance. I mean, honestly, he could have not, you know, no one would have blamed him if he had said, we don't, we don't need this kid here. So it, it did contribute to that grit that I think is, is yeah. part of the reason that uh, I'm so successful today. Well, so you didn't quit and you stayed out of trouble. And uh, finally, in uh, May or June of 1989, you actually graduated. You're a second lieutenant uh, in the infantry and off to Fort Benning for in Georgia for infantry basic training and airborne and ranger schools. How did those go? Were they were that's that all smooth sailing. No, <laughs> I don't think any part of my story, Alan, is is I don't think smooth sailing is any any part of what people would say how I uh, made it through. Just like everybody else, right? You just you're just trying to get through the day. The um, so when I showed up at West Point in the summer of '85, I could do 17 push-ups. I was 6'2", 127 pounds. I could do 17 push-ups. So I got infantry. I picked Berlin as my first assignment. And I had gone to airborne school in 87. And that, that did go well. That was a good experience. Ranger school, when I showed up the first day, you got to be able to do 42 push-ups in two minutes. My first 10 push-ups, he counted zero of them as quality push-ups. So I knew I was in trouble because I'm looking at 42, 43. <laughs> so if he's not counting the first 10, I don't think I'm getting there. And then he, uh, he, they give you seven minutes because in, in ranger school, you're allowed to fail every task once. So you're allowed to retake it. But if you retake it and fail it, you're out. So they give me a seven minute break and tell me to restart. I think the second time I, I got to 39, which is quite honestly a miracle. And uh, so I was kicked out. I was kicked out of ranger school. So I, I went, I, I got, uh, went back to the mortar school. I did some uh, work for the airborne school. And then I got back into ranger school. I failed the Florida swamps. So there's four phases, right? There's the, you know, the original phase, there's the mountain phase, the swamp phase and the desert phase. And I failed um, Florida. So I had to recycle Florida. Um, and again, you know, I could have quit, but I, I, I didn't. Here's an interesting fact. Uh, I was with a kid named Ralph Hedenberg from the Connecticut National Guard and another kid, um, whose dad was actually a colonel in the army. So I guess he was a, 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 an army brat, um, Ross Kaufman. They're both generals today. <laughs> so I'm the failure of the ranger group, right? Like I dropped out, right? Like, you know, so I did graduate from ranger school, but it's just interesting that my two ranger buddies, Ralph Hedenberg is, is now a, a uh, brigadier general with the Connecticut National Guard and uh, Ross Kaufman just pinned on his uh, second star uh, about a month ago. So it's, it was, that was an incredible crucible event in my life for sure. So you mentioned, uh, I think that you had picked Berlin for your first assignment. You have a five-year commitment. Uh, and while you're in Germany in that particular period of time, uh, I recall that George Bush 41 uh, responded to the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait 
by launching Operation Desert Storm, later called the First Gulf War. Uh, what was your experience in Berlin like during that particular time? Yeah, it was, it was interesting, right? Because, uh, I, I, you know, in the military, you, you meet a lot of guys that like, you know, love the hunting and the fishing and the outdoors, man. Like, that is not me. And, and I even feel like a bit of a, 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 a fraud as a, as a Cub Scout den leader, because I'm like not, you know, Ricky Raccoon, right? And uh, so I was like, I'm going to pick Berlin. Like, that'll be my, I want to be an urban warrior, right? And uh, so it's just interesting that I picked the largest city in, in Europe for my first assignment. But then a lot of people, you know, uh, my year group all went off to the, to the desert. So I did volunteer, right? They did create a volunteer list. And so I raised my hand. I'm like, you know, I, I'll, I'll go. Um, but they did um, call me. But we didn't have pagers or cell phones back then. They called my house. You know, I was down on the, the Kudam chasing frawl lines, you know? <laughs> so I, they called the next guy on the list, you know? And it was a guy named uh, Pat Anderson, who I'm still friends with today. But like, he's married with a, a brand new baby he had come out of the Ranger Battalions and gone to Officers Candidate School. Um, he hadn't told his wife he volunteered. So he's like, call Deerline. They're like, we already did, you know. And uh, the next morning, they were already all assembling and getting ready to go. And a few got attached to units, but most of them just went to Kuwait and set up ranges for people to go and, and get their weapons set before they went into... Um, combat, but uh, not a lot of people from Berlin went. Um, you know, Berlin has a special relationship with the United States, right? At the, at the end of World War II, it was the Americans that came in and stopped all the pillaging, the plundering, the rapes, and, and put law in place, right? So the older folks remember that. Then next, the Berlin airlift with the food and dropping that. And then when the, the Berlin Wall came up, it was our tanks that rolled up there. So anyone that's middle-aged in Berlin in 89 loved Americans. And, and teenagers wanted to, to be like Americans and, and pop culture. And so Berlin was a great place to be stationed in terms of a, a place that had a, a really great you know, German-American relationship. But there was stress during, during that, that time. And, and there were protests, you know, no blood for oil and, and things like that. So, you know, it was an interesting time to, to be there. But most of my uh, experience in Berlin was, was very positive. But I did not go to the Gulf. Uh, instead, I, I drank uh, Hefeweizen and beer and <laughs> ran around causing trouble. Well, your five-year commitment was up in 1993 following the end of that war. There had been a big buildup, of course, of the armed, army in particular uh, in preparation for, for Desert Storm. And so after the war, I think it was President Bill Clinton that started a drawdown. Uh, but right about the time your commitment expires, uh, did that influence your decision to leave the service? No, I mean, there, but there was a riff, right? A reduction in forces or, or what uh, academy graduates would call an early out. And, and plenty of my classmates did. They got back from the Gulf and they're like, all right, I did my part. And they raised their hand at the three or four year mark. But no, like, I, so at this point, I'm 26 years old and I'm living the plan that a 13 year old kid made, right? Like when I was 13, I'm like, I'm gonna go to West Point. I'm gonna go in the army for five years. And then I'm gonna get out and become a successful business uh, person. Uh, what that is, I don't know, right? Like my dad got on the train, he went to New York City, he came back, there was macaroni and cheese on my plate. I didn't even know what civilians did. Um, and in fact, uh, Major Besock, who was the, uh, the battalion S3, the major in the US Army that I was working for, great guy, like, you know, honor graduate of Ranger School, honor graduate of the Q course. He was just literally a, a total badass. And I was working for him and I submitted my resignation paperwork, right? It was time for me to go out and I'll go in the reserves and, you know, be a part-time soldier, full-time business guy. Um, so I handed him my resignation and he ripped it up. 
And he goes, Tom, I don't have time for your jokes today. Because I can, I can be a bit of a jokester, right? He goes, I don't have time for your jokes today. He rips it up and throws it out. I go, well, well two things, sir. One, I'm not joking. Uh, and two, you taught me too well. I have two other copies of that on my desk. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, well, you, you love this stuff. He was, he was devastated, right? Because he had been a mentor of mine for over a year. And I said, no, sir, I do love this stuff. I just, it's not what I want to do for a living. And this is the logical point where I either go on to the advanced course or I, you know, become a part-time soldier, full-time uh, civilian. You know, well, I guess we're going to get to the latter part of that story. So when, when I get to Dick's to go into re find a reserve unit or national guard unit. And, and I had gotten hired by Johnson and Johnson to go sell surgical instruments. Um, they're like, yeah, you'll, you'll be a first Lieutenant. I'm like, what? Well, hold on a second. <laughs> I'm a captain. I'm like, I'm two weeks away from, you know, being an O3. Oh no, 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 no. But today's today. You're getting out October 11th. You're, not going to be a captain for another two weeks. So you got to be a lieutenant in the reserves for, you know, don't worry. It'll, it'll, it'll go quick. It'll be a couple of years. I'm like, what? <laughs> so I, I didn't go in the reserves or the national guard. I, I went to the IRR, the individual ready reserve. I enjoyed being in the military. I enjoyed uh, the people I served with. I enjoyed uh everything about my military experience, but it, it, it was, it was not, nothing that had happened made me change my mind and decide that I want to do this for a career. It wasn't that I, and I look back at it now, I mean, I wasn't a great officer. I was, you know, I wasn't special. And when I looked to my left and right, there were special guys. Like there were people that were really good at this. And some of them were non-commissioned officers. Some of them were privates. Some of them were officers. But like you could tell they had that passion and they, 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 they lived and breathed it. And, and I, looked, I, I didn't have that, that passion. Um, so I, I, I'm at peace with the choice to get out when I did. So you become a civilian uh, and you work for a series of three companies in kind of progressive roles. Uh, while you were in Berlin, you had actually enrolled in grad school, and pretty soon now you've got both a master's in systems management from USC. Uh, you picked up an MBA from NYU Stern School. Was all of that just life happening, or it sounds like that could be part of this bigger plan, preparing to maybe run your own company someday? Yeah, it's, um, wow, you've done your homework, brother. Uh, <laughs> the... Yeah, so the, the, the master's that I knocked out at, at USC was actually tricky because I was stationed in Berlin. So we would go to school Tuesdays and Thursday nights or Monday, Wednesday, depending on the semester. But every other weekend, we would have to drive out west. So if anyone were to look at a map in, of Germany, Berlin is off to the east. And then the rest of the army was off in West Germany or what was the former West Germany, right? But it was a seven to nine hour drive to class. So we, myself, Pat Walsh, and Bob Penna would get in the car midnight on Friday, drive all night, go to class all day Saturday, uh, five hours on Sunday, and then drive home. And we did that for two years, right? And then if you had a deployment, you just missed class, and then you had to do all the, the, the makeup work. So, yeah, that was not easy. Um, in terms of the MBA, I was in sales. So there were plenty of people that said, oh, you don't need an MBA, you're a sales guy. And in fact, you know, the folks at J&J, &J, you know, so, and even though they had tuition reimbursement programs, my boss didn't support it, right? They want you selling 24 seven. Um, but I knocked out my MBA part-time at NYU. Now that took me four years, you know, and same thing, like you'd go Tuesday, uh, Tuesday, Thursday, Monday, Wednesday. And I tried to take as many classes as I could on the weekend. You know, I was single, I was living in New York City. So, you know, it, it wasn't hard for me to give up my Saturdays. And that way, even if I hadn't done my homework, I could get it all done Friday night um, and then just make up for it and party really hard on Saturday night. Um, I don't know that it was a, 
like there was some plan. I'm definitely not an idea guy. So getting the additional education, the master's in systems management when I was in the military was so that I could be exposed to business because I was in the military for at that point eight years. Like, so I wanted to learn to use the language of business, marketing, accounting, right? I had studied some of that a little bit at West Point, but not as much. The MBA was sort of the same thing. I said, well, if I'm going to be successful in business, I need the fundamental building blocks. Um, and different people learn in different ways. I always enjoyed the discipline and structure of academics and being in an academic environment and case study work and, and research and having to submit projects. Um, and it was cool because I was in the middle of the dot com. So I was applying what I was learning in my MBA to my work every day. You mentioned that uh, you were in the IRR, the Individual Ready Reserves. If you're in a regular reserve unit, you're a weekend warrior, you do uh, a couple of weeks a year and all of that. But this is, don't call us, we'll call you if we ever need you. And that's unlikely kind of a kind of an existence there. Um, and out of sight, out of mind. All of a sudden, something came out of the blue in about 2006 that was a big, big change in your life. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so again, they were like, oh, you can be a lieutenant. <clears throat> I'm like, I'm not doing that. Like, I'm supposed to be captain, right? Let my ego get the best of me. And then like, in, I should have known I was still on their radar, right? Because every couple of years, they would send you a piece of paper like, hey, is this still your uh, address? Yeah, you know. Um, and then, hey, is this still your address? And do you have an email? Oh, yeah, you know. And then like, hey, is this still your address? What's your email? And do you have a cell phone? You know, yeah, you know. And, and but I, every couple of years, whatever, I'd sign that form and mail it back. So I'm not one of those guys or girls that didn't know that I was in the reserves. There's plenty of people who thought, oh, I didn't realize I had to resign my commission or, or whatever. Like, I knew that I was still in the IRR. In fact, I always used my military ID card to get Avis discounts and holiday in discounts when I was traveling. So like, you know, I, I can't be one of those guys that claimed I didn't, I didn't know. And I then certainly you didn't know they would call me in. I, I certainly didn't know they would call me up. You know? And when they did, you know, so it was, it was October of 05. It was via a Western Union, like a telegram that was taped to the desk, taped to the door of my uh, apartment in New York City. I had just gotten back from a business trip and I'm like, what's this? And it was like, yeah, like you got 30 days to report or won't be put out for your arrest. I was like, what is this, Vietnam? You know, um, so I called him up. I was like, I think you got the wrong guy. It was straight out of Abbott and Costello, who's on first. Either that or he thought I was Forrest Gump, right? Because I'm like, dear line. He's like, yeah. I go, Delta, Echo, India, Echo, Romeo, Lima, Echo. Yes. Thomas J, 38, 10, 11, 60. He's like, Yes. I was like, why are you calling me up? You know, like, I'm a, I got a bad back, a big belly, and you know, I'm nearsighted. Like, I'm not the airborne ranger killer that I used to be. And, um, but I later found out that what they were doing sort of made sense, right? Like, and they were now trying to set up civil affairs, the non-kinetic folks, right? So I wasn't going to be kicking down doors and chasing bad guys. So they said, well, how do we stand up these units to go do? you know, what Americans are classically calling reconstruction, but it was like economic development, governance, um, uh, humanitarian, nation building. <laughs> yeah, humanitarian aid, you know. So, and that's what I was called up to do. So I went to Fort Bragg in um, the fall of 05, and we spent six months, you know, welcome back to the army, including having to go into the MBC tent. You know, you, you, you never miss that. Um, instead of an M16, I had an M4, you know, and, but other than that, it was okay. I'm sort of getting a second chance at this. Um, but before I decided to go, I did have some dark days. I'm not going to lie that I was like, oh, this is great. Where do I, how do I get, you know, I was like, I don't think I'm going to do this. Right. Um, I'm proud to be a West Pointer. I'm proud to be a Ranger. I'm proud of my country and I consider myself a patriot. So like, it was sort of like, I call it the shaving or the grandchildren, right? Like I got to shave every morning. So how can you look yourself in the mirror 
right? If you said no, like your country called you and asked for your help and you said no, like, what are you going to tell your grandchildren? Like, you know, the, the, the United States needed me and I called a lawyer, you know, Te so yeah, go ahead. Technically, you did have the right to say no, I understand. Is that correct? Yeah, so I, but that, so that part, so I, you know, so I, I said, all right, I, I'm going to go. And like, so they clear out my apartment in New York City and uh, literally there's like an old mattress and a telephone. Like there's two items in, in the apartment. They've now shipped my stuff to be stored at Fort Hamilton in Brooklyn and the phone rings and it was St. Louis. It was Human Resources Command saying, yes, we did in fact make a mistake. You're past your military service obligation. If you don't wanna report, you don't have to. But at that point, I had uh, taken leave from my thing. I had hit the gym for a couple of weeks and uh, I was looking forward to serving my country. And then when I reported to Fort Jackson for their 10 day little welcome back training program, they did, like there was 60 of us that went in a room. I guess they called up 360 and only 60 of us showed up. Um, and then of the 60, they're like, you know, Abbott, Anderson, Ball, you know, Deerline, you know, uh, Davis, you know, they were going, and it was alphabetically 10, 10 names they called and said, you folks don't have to be here. So if you want to leave, please go to the back and see Sergeant Smith or whatever it is. Two people got up that night and went back. And then over the course of the next week, I think four more people left. I think that, you know, at that point I had made a decision and I was going to serve. Uh, and eventually they did make me sign a form saying, I am volunteering for the ride. Uh, and then went to Fort Bragg. The only other time that I, I, I volunteered uh, for combat versus a cushy job in the green zone is they kept telling us, we're gonna put you in a role that fits your background. And my role would have been economic development and micro loans for these small businesses, but that they, they assigned us alphabetically. <laughs> they, they made us hand in our resume and write bios and list skills. And then when the list came out, it was, I was assigned with guys with last names A, B, C, and D. And then company B Co was <laughs> E, F, G, H. So they didn't even read our bios, but I did finally get someone in the green zone request me to come work in their office. But at that point, I had already been in Baghdad for two weeks, had already transitioned, had already met my Iraqi counterparts, had already spent time training with my team. So I didn't want to go to a green zone job. Um, you know, so as luck would have it, you know, I got popped. All right, Tom, we're going to take a break now and actually wrap this up as episode one uh, with the good news that uh, we'll be continuing this interview with Tom Deerline on episode two of Profiles in Service. I look forward to seeing you then. Until then, this is Alan Salisbury saying thanks for watching, listening, and being part of this podcast. This podcast is powered by and copyright of the Coda Support Foundation. Coda Support presents Profiles and Service is hosted by Major General Alan B. Salisbury and produced by Carly Van Tassel. The opinions of the guests on the show do not directly reflect the stance of the Coda Support Foundation. To learn more about Coda Support, please visit www.codasupport.org or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Finally, if you or someone you know is a service member, veteran, caregiver, or military family member in need of assistance, please visit codasupport.org slash get help or create a free account at patriotlink.org.